Hello, August Fall to Rogue, Hig on Lowert Show and Kind Show, we Queen Guelga. Hello and welcome to the lunchtime open newsroom presented by the Good Information Project and the Journal. Uh, we're delighted to introduce our very informed panel for this very interesting discussion about what the EU can do to help grow the Irish language, kind of a broader discussion about minority languages in general. We're joined by Jim Marr. A senior policy advisor at the European Parliament, working on EU Southeast Asia relations. Jim formerly taught Irish at the University of St. Thomas in Minneapolis and has been long time an advocate for the increased use of Irish in Brussels and the EU. Falter Oath, Jim. Uh, we're also joined by Theresa, Dr. Theresa Lynn. Theresa is a research fellow at the ADAPT Centre in DCU and served as a principal uh, investigator on the Gale Tech project which focuses on the development of tools and resources for the Irish language. He's also a core contributor to the upcoming National Digital Strategy for Irish and is also an EU uh, part of an EU-funded European language project. So, Fulcher Roth, Theresa, our own reporter, Ronan Duffy, joins us as well. He'll be covering the Irish language issue throughout this cycle of the Good Information Project. Um, and also what we've learned so far this month, including a very interesting poll result. So, Fulcher Roth, our FOD, uh, and welcome to the audience as well for joining us for this lunchtime special. Just two uh, notes before we get started. This event won't be completely Oscar And um, There is a live event, though, that will be held through the Irish language by the Good Information Project at the end of the month. It's a panel discussion held in Dingle in person uh, called On Gaelga Fui Vru No Fui Vla on Friday the 25th of March. Uh, at 4.30 at St. James's Church. So you can find out details about that on Eventbrite if you want to know more. And it's also being dropped into the, the chat box there. You can see there. Another uh, quick note is that there is that chat function and a, a Q&A function as well at the bottom of your screen. If you have something you'd like to ask the panelists, if they mention something you'd like them to elaborate on or you want to hear more about, uh, do ask. And we will have... Uh, 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the session where we can ask them your questions or elaborate on something that might have been message, mentioned during the discussion. That's that. So let's get started. And we're going to start a discussion about language with some numbers. So we've done a poll with Ireland Thinks to gauge how the public feels about their language, feels about the Irish language and how it's used. And Ronan, if you wouldn't mind telling us what the poll indicated about how the public feels about the presence of Irish in day to day life. Yeah, no problem, Grania. Um, so the poll we did with, with Aaron Thinks, it polled about a thousand people um, and it's broken down by a number of demographics. So age, region, gender and that kind of thing. It's published this morning on on the journal. .e. So if you want to look at the precise numbers, it's all there. And what it did essentially was gauge people's, first of all, their feelings towards the language and um, how often they speak it, their fluency and how they feel um, about efforts to, to grow the language, whether or not that's um, Grail Skullina and, you know, positive discrimination in favour of Irish speakers in the public sector, those kind of things. And kind of before I go into numbers, I just kind of maybe give a broad sense of, of what it found. Um, I think one of the main findings is that there is a large proportion of people who feel that they would like to see more Irish in their daily life. Um, that's perhaps not a surprise. It's probably a positive finding for people who are who are interested in language. I think the way it was put to people is, would, you know, would they like to see it on a daily basis? And what was the description of daily basis? Would you like to see most people use Cooper Fucker on a daily basis? Um, that was 65% of people said that that was what they favoured. So quite a large number of people um, wanted that to happen. Um, they were also asked a similar question about would they like to see more or less of it in their daily life? Again, they kind of mirrored each other. We saw 63% were in favour of that. So definitely broad um, a feeling that more Irish needs to be in daily life. So it was only in fact, um, I think it was, it was in the low numbers who who felt that um, um, we needed less Irish. Um, interestingly, there was 17% of people, um, which is a small, relatively, you know, judge for yourself, a relatively small number, who felt that Irish should be the predominant language of the country. So that's 17%, so just less than one in five. Um, so obviously there's an understanding that Irish is an important part of our culture, and that 
is held up in the poll, but also there's an attachment to the fact that English is the primary way that business and everything else is done uh, through this country. But interestingly, um, there was a slightly higher number of people in Dublin who wanted to see Irish as the primary language uh, higher than in other areas like Connacht and Munster, which perhaps have more graphic areas. There's some kind of interesting uh, findings there. Uh, in terms of fluency, I think that what the poll did was kind of backed up what we saw from previous census polling in that um, there's about 17% of people describe themselves as fluent. And this is a self-reported poll, so this is their own people's people's own interpretation of what it means to be fluent. So 17% um, said they were fluent in Irish. And that's made up of about 4% of people who said they were fluent and speak Irish on uh, a daily basis. And... 13% of people who are fluent and speak it on a slightly less uh, frequent basis than that. So there's kind of, even within people who are fluent, there's a there's quite a broad um, differential between those who actually use the language. And, and, and something else that I think that that is very interesting from the poll and something else that is particularly of note for legislators and for people um, you know, involved in this area is the, the importance of young people especially seem to place on the language. Um, we can discuss the reasons for that separately, but we found that people who are 18 to 20, uh, 24 years of age, 75%, so three quarters of, of people in that younger age group said that the Irish language was either important or very important to their national identity. So quite a high number. And even that's compared to the overall figure was 58%. And between 55 to 64 year olds, it was 53%. So just over half to three quarters. So among young people, there is certainly an attachment to the language. Um, and that is also matched by uh, a level of fluency within younger age groups with um like we mentioned earlier, although the overall figure was twenty was seventeen percent uh, fluency among eighteen to twenty four year olds, it was twenty seven percent. That falls to twenty percent among thirty to forty four year olds, and then further still to twelve percent among forty five. Uh, to 54 year olds. Now, that could perhaps be the distance from education, people who are younger, are closer to when they were learned in school. So all these factors kind of, we kind of see a picture of, of how Irish is used within the community and perhaps how as people, you know, get older and get further away from education, that could perhaps wane. So that's also something I think that people can point to and, and perhaps target as, as a way to, to improve it. Just to, um, to emphasize that, I think one of the one of the main ones, one of the main um, findings that jumped out to me was was fifty two percent of people who said they have some Irish, so they they you know they describe themselves as not fluent but have some Irish, but they would not feel confident enough to listen to an Irish language radio or television program. So that's kind of fifty two percent of people who have some Irish, but perhaps that's an area that needs to be worked on. I think that's just something that jumped out at me from, from the poll. That's really interesting, and you know. If we listen to those results, it seems to paint a quite a positive picture overall. Theresa, I saw you nodding along to a couple of the things that Ronan was saying there, particularly around, you know, uh, the, the the identity and, and, and that point at the end about being able to speak some of it, but maybe not feeling confident in it. What do you make of that? And, and you know, our, our general attitude towards the Irish, Irish language at the moment? Yeah, there's some re really, really interesting findings there. You could pull that apart for a long time, I think. Um, the confidence part is so important. And I think for a long time, many people felt they needed to be absolutely fluent before they could, you know, try to have a conversation. There's a lot of shame attached to that. And we won't go into details of why Irish people carry shame that they shouldn't, but um, we have this hang up about needing to be fluent before we engage with something. Um, what I found, and, and also when you were talking Ron, about media, um, you know, people are afraid to maybe tune into Radio Nalif or Radio Nagel Sokta. Um, and actually, that's how I improved my Irish was just sort of passively having that in the background, even when I was driving. What I found in the last few years, like RTE have taken this on to FM, Today FM, is to normalize the presence of Irish within the English context. So if you just have a show where you have a little bit of Irish here and there, and um, the Kupla Fuckle, as you say, 
people don't get so panicked when they hear it and they don't feel this panic. I'm not good enough. I can't be here. I don't belong to this Irish language uh, community or environment. Uh, when it's normalized and it's more normalized more on media, I think this really leads to a shift in how people embrace and feel comfortable. That might be this case with this generational shift. I know um, I put my ears on myself now, but like when, when I was a teenager and at school to speak Irish outside of school was like, what are you doing like that belongs in the school where I feel uh, younger people are way more confident in themselves. Thank God. Not carrying the shame around with them. Um, and it's OK to be part of groups that speak Irish and to engage online with it, you know, on social media and not to be so hung up about having the correct spelling and social media because you don't even have to do that in English. So that's fine. So I think this is reflecting this poll is reflecting a lot of what we're seeing anyway. I think it also reflects maybe open mindedness of your own readership, which is good, too. I think that's a, it's an interesting point. And Jim, if I could bring you in and, and ask you the about the general attitudes towards the Irish, do we have a lot of reason to be hopeful? You know, how do you think, how do you analyse how, how the public is feeling about um, the language and what might be driving an in, increase in, of interest in it as well? I think the findings uh, definitely have, you know, some some sign of hope. And the seventeen percent figure for people fluent, um, actually, I think is is better than I would have expected. Obviously, it's never going to be as, an, an, enough. We, we would rather it be much higher than that, but it's already not bad. Um, I think uh, Irish is in a in a in a healthier place than it has been for a long time. Probably, um, I'm calling you here from Brussels, and actually next week I'm going to see the Irish film Aracht in the cinema. Um, I think it's the first time I've ever heard of a, a film Moscoelga being in the cinema in in Belgium in Brussels. Um, I think uh, Teresa mentioned uh, you know how important it is that you know it's normalised in programming and so on. And I, I believe I saw it earlier this morning that yet that Prime Time had a segment on Ukraine um, on RTE, uh, which was Oskwelka, which I think is great. I think that you know the more uh, the national broadcaster and other broadcasters like RTE uh, put um, Irish into their make it a normal part of uh, you know even if it's a program that's in English. Why not put in a report in Irish on something like the terrible um, uh, invasion of Ukraine? Um, I thought I taught Irish for a year in in America, so um, I know how much interest there is globally in the language. I also worked with Irish for many years here in Brussels. Um, it's now an official, a fully official language of the European Union since the 1st of January. I think that's really a historical development uh, that it's um, our whole game, as you'd say, in Irish uh, with all the other 23 languages. Um, and I know, for example, I think uh, in, in, the, in the end of January, uh, John Kelly MEP submitted the first ever amendment to legislation in Irish. Uh, which was, uh, you know, first time in, in Ireland's almost uh, 50 years membership of the Union. Uh, last month in the European Parliament, the European Ombudsman, Emily O'Reilly, delivered her annual report um, in, in a speech entirely in Irish. She spoke for eight minutes in Irish in the Parliament. So these are all uh, positive developments. And uh, whether it's here in Brussels or uh, back home in Ireland or, you know, indeed in other parts of the world, like in America, I think there's a lot of interest in the language and uh, we yeah, we'll get, need to get more and more people speaking it. And another interesting thing as well would be to find out that, I mean, the, the poll today is, is is one thing, but the census results, I think there's a census in Ireland next month. So let's see how um, it looks uh, in terms of daily Irish speakers there as well. Yeah, it can be a hard thing to define fluency when it, you know, it's a feeling a lot of the time about how confident you yeah. are to speak it. Um, but, you know, Ronan, could I ask you about the state's policy towards the Irish languages? You know, how is the state addressing kind of the, the Irish language question or issue? What is it doing? What, you know, what is it, what is, what is it aiming to do? What are the policies the government has to try and promote the Irish language? Well, I think one of the things to, to kind of bear in mind for you when you're we're talking about this is going to the main uh, framework that the government is working in. It's called the 20 year strategy for the Irish language. And the 20 years we're talking about is 2010 to 2030. So we're well over half uh, through that strategy. And yeah, kind of there has been various efforts to assess how that's going. And I think Jim mentioned there that census next month, and that will be an important point because I think one of the 
central um, figures and one of the central planks that people point to as part of the strategy is that they want to, um, the government is seeking a quarter of a million to so 250,000 um, daily Irish speakers by 2030. Now, it's a very ambitious target. Um, when it was set back in 2010, it was about 83,000 daily Irish speakers. So what they were essentially looking, looking for was a trebling in that time. Unfortunately, when we had the previous census in 2016, it had actually dipped to about to about 73,000. So we will hope firstly when the results from the delayed census that we have uh, next month that there will be that will be slowed and perhaps reversed and that will be moving towards the 250,000. Even if it's not going to be achieved, that's kind of the the target that's still in place um, at the moment. So what are what are the government doing to achieve it? And um, well. To first of all, point that Jack Chambers is the Minister of State uh, for the Grail Duct. He kind of told the doll the grass month that this year's uh, budget allocation for the promotion of Irish language is 85 million. And as far as to get to that 250,000, I suppose there's a, there's a number of prongs approach to it because I think there's an acknowledgement that there are people with different levels of Irish within the country and there has to be different approaches for that. Obviously, you have the Gweltic areas, and that's one specific issue that the uh, area that needs to be protected and developed. So, the plan is for um, an increase of 25% in Irish speakers in Gweltic areas, and that will flow into the overall target. There are a number of specific um, legislative uh, measures put in place as part of the Official Languages Bill in relation to the Gweltic. I'll discuss them uh, perhaps in a minute. So, that's one prong approach is, is the Gweltic. Secondly, is in terms of the wider public, there is an acknowledgement that for Irish to grow and for people to listen to Irish more habitually on a on a kind of daily basis, on, on a more um, you know informal basis, they have to also be able to do things in the state on a formal basis. So state services, um, there state services, there is an, uh, an acknowledgement, an acknowledgement that that has to be more provisions in place for people to to um, to get state services through Irish. So that's, for example, if you want to apply for your passport through Irish, very often you see reports of someone going to a guard station and the, the, the specific form isn't there in Irish and you have to go somewhere else to get it. If you want to do all these things through Irish, there are roadblocks in place. So as part of the official languages bill, um, it was... Uh, laid down that all public services in Gaeltic areas have to be um, available through Irish, and that the minister also has the power to implement that other forms, um, in regardless of the area, have to be available in Irish as well. So it's about kind of making those state services um, more available to, to people. Um, as well. And the third um, point is in relation to to education, of course, and the increase in the number of girls schooling. And that's particularly a focus um, the Minister Norma Foley has, has referenced in early years, and we're talking here near a kind of age, and that that will create uh, more of a just a natural progression of people, of students and young people through the Irish language, so that when parents are, you know, are working through the patronage system in which local schools are selected, the preferred model, that Irish will be part of that because the children will already have had that exposure by that point. Theresa, what's your analysis of the government strategy? Are they doing all the right thing? <laughs> it's a big question, Grania. Um, first of all, I would say this 20 year plan, it's quite ambitious, right? For, for some things, increasing the number of speakers by that amount is quite ambitious for 20 years because it takes a generational change, right? So all these kids, which is fantastic, the increasing in girl school and also the bun school and hopefully more man school and that we really won't see the effect of that on society for another 20 years, if you like, 15, 20 years. Um, so this increase, trying to hit these targets by number of speakers just within 20 years, it, it's very ambitious. And I'm all for very ambitious projects because it gets us moving. Um, so I wouldn't get too concerned yet about the lack of progress in the numbers because you can't teach people overnight. <laughs> and definitely you can't teach people who've left school overnight to come back and improve their Irish levels. Um, there's so many different realms of what the government's doing and how much money you know they, they give to the Department of the Gale Talk, how that's dispersed and who decides on what's, where the money is spent. Um, and for a long time, I suppose increasing the number of speakers has been a huge focus, be that in, you know, language classes, supporting language um, translation, training programs and so on. Um, 
there's sometimes maybe too much of a focus on that, just this increase in number of speakers without looking at the whole infrastructure to see where do these Irish speakers then live in a society where Irish is normalised and part of their life. And so Ronan touched on that, is that the public services need to improve so that people can conduct their lives. If they've gone to the effort of wanting to speak Irish as their main language, they want they can conduct their lives um, in their own language as part of their language right. And that should be the case. They should be able to choose that. Um, but a lot of the public services can't for many reasons, and some of them are technical reasons. And uh, we can talk about this a little bit later on when we're talking about language technology, but there has been a huge lack of interest and um, awareness, if you like, or uh, investment into technology that supports the Irish language. So if you can imagine these uh, public services and our, our world in AI is shifting to online everything, apps for accessing every bit of information we need to get, down the line, we'll be talking to chatbots um, because the infrastructure in Ireland will grow because we're, you know, we're, we're a hub for technology. But if Irish people can't access that through their language because the technology doesn't re recognize the Irish language, then we have an issue. And, and that needs to be looked at now and last year and a few years ago for this long term strategy. Right. So it just depends. There's some avenues that are actually being focused on that are useful. And the support for Gael Scullin is fantastic. Um, but there's other avenues that haven't. Um, in the absence of that support from the state, we've seen a lot of movement at the grassroots level. OK, so we see there are some Gael Scullin, you know, springing up from a grassroots level to uh, address the demand for uh, education in Irish. You'll also see the likes of the pop-up Gael Talked or that group Bora, who are like a, you know, a business networking group. Um, trying to connect people um, and create these sort of grassroots strong movements, not movements in the sense of activism, but movements in the sense of we were able to conduct and use Irish in our lives. Um, and so I think the, the government, the, the government, the department, the, um, the Gael talked, and a lot of other departments actually should be looking out to see what's happening at this grassroots level that's working. OK, what's working and how can we help that? Um, and the same as, like I said, with social media, this is really strengthening an Irish language and maybe look into how that is really helping everything sort of shoot off in a direction that was unexpected. What can we learn from that rather than just going with traditional ideas of the policy changes we sh they should be making? And just to touch on that for a, for a second, I suppose we could perhaps look at how well are we we're doing in that, in that regard. I think there was uh, a report uh, published by the C Commissioner Changa in 2019 about people's dealings with public services. And I think they outlined about 700 different complaints that people had in trying to access public services and were unable to do it through Irish. And I think, you know, we often here one of the main concerns is even ICT problems when it comes to the Sheena Fada and people's names and the, the, the chaos that that has caused for people and it, it shouldn't do and I think that's an important part of the official languages the official languages bill as well um, one of the things that was interesting from the poll was that one of the central planks of uh, the government legislation is that by 2030, 20% uh, of new hires to public bodies should have a competency in Irish. And the thinking, of course, there is that when you increase the competency of Irish within the public service, that will naturally increase the um, the level of um, interaction that people may have to Grelga in, 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 in public sector. Now, in the poll, I think we found a marginal uh, number of people perhaps were in favour of that. I think you would say so. So the 20% um, target that the government has, I think it was 14% said that that target should be higher and that it's too low. And you had 29% said it was a bet right. So about 43% said 20% of Irish speakers in public service. Yeah, that seems fine or even go better. But there were 39% of people who said that was too high, who said that that target uh, is not something that we should be aiming to achieve um, or that protect, perhaps the percentage should be a bit lower. And I think that that's the kind of level that you often see this kind of things in poll when people um, on an ideological basis are very in favour of something, but when they see something that might impact on them or their families negatively, in this case, maybe getting a job down in the future, they perhaps change their views somewhat. And I think that's part of the areas where, you know, these the balance needs to be worked out. 
Yeah, I, I'm going to ask Jim about the importance of the formal kind of structures now in a second. But if I can ask you, Ronan, first about that moment in the European Parliament recently, that kind of watershed shed moment um, where the, about the Irish language and, and how important it was. Could you just tell us a bit about, about that? Yeah, it's kind of a GM outline there. I think a lot of people wouldn't be aware that uh, the Irish language uh, only became a full working language of the European Union at the beginning of 2022. So first of January, it's been an official language since um, I think 2007. So, but what it means now at this point is that um, um, MEPs can make submissions during. Uh, commission meetings and committee meetings, three Grailga and can also, you know, table amendments in Irish as well. And that's what we saw um, a couple of months ago when Sean Kelly tabled the first amendment in Irish as part of the International Trade Committee. And I think, I think he said before, you know, several many Irish MEPs have spoken Irish in the Parliament before, but this actually means that the work can actually be done in Irish and that you know things can be tabled and. That creates, of course, employment opportunities for Irish speakers in Brussels and Strasbourg. And, and all that feeds into uh, perhaps um, the reason why it, it's important that, that and people see an opportunity and a reason why that they can pursue um, a career through Irish. So, Jim, if I could ask you about that, you know, what can we say about the status of the Irish language at EU level? Ronan mentioned employment opportunities. There was an influx of 200 new Irish translators since 2020. Has that shaped the perception of the Irish language? Look, I think it's hugely important. And um, yeah, indeed, many people in Ireland might not be aware of it, but this uh, this full official status, uh, it was a long time coming. Uh, there was a derogation in place for many years, uh, which kept being you know, uh, renewed. But I think that uh, for people here in Brussels, the perception was they wondered why Irish was not a fully official language even sooner, because they don't see really any difference between our language, Irish, and you know all the other 23 uh, official languages, including relatively small languages such as Estonian, Maltese, and uh, you know even Finnish, and so on. Um, so I think the fact that uh, a European uh, a that Irish people can understand what's going on in Brussels, what's being decided uh, by their democratically elected representatives in the European Parliament, or what's uh, being done in the Council when when it comes to you know implementing sanctions on Ukraine and so on. All of this, I mean, if we want the European Union to be based on democracy, it can only be done like that if people can understand what's going on, if they can interact with uh, the European institutions. Um, and it's not only, um, I mean, there's many translators, uh, lawyer, linguists, interpreters being employed now, but it's not only that, the, the European Parliament, for example, now has made available and this is well actually before the 1st of January, all of its uh, visitor services um, are available in, in Irish, right down to you know multimedia uh, visit sets, if you go on a visit of the parliament, um, pretty much absolutely everything is being made available in Irish, all the videos that are produced by the parliament for social media. Um, I, as you mentioned, I, I no longer work with Irish in the European Parliament, but um, I did uh, for, I, I did work with Irish for over seven years, and I set up the Europarl GA Twitter account, um, which was basically the first. So it's the first. Uh, dedicated uh, social media presence of a European institution in Irish. And uh, to be honest, it's one of the very few cases of any public body having a social media presence that's entirely Os Um So I think all of that is important. Um, I think uh, Theresa made a, a few points as well in terms of uh, training that uh, people with the skills are that uh, that people are trained to have the skills needed to, to actually get the jobs in Brussels and Luxembourg and everywhere else um, and back at home um, I know I did a master's in UCD almost 10 years ago now that I think was funded by the by the Department for the Quail Talked. Um, without that, I wouldn't have the job I have today. I wouldn't have taught Irish for a year in America. Uh, their access to public services that's, of course, a very big issue. I think I saw that Aidan O'Day is uh, one of the people watching um, uh, today. I think he works with Conrad Aguilga. He went on Liveline on RTE um, about a month ago and um, uh, spoke about uh, public services in Irish. And he wasn't exactly... Uh, uh, yeah, dealt with uh, very no. respect, 
respectfully by the host of Liveline. Um, I don't know if he's able to chip in on that himself, but there's other things as well, like uh, uh, even road signage. Now, when I go home and I see the the the, the road signs, uh, bilingual road signs in Irish. Um, you in Ireland, uh, you can see how the English is much more visible than the Irish. The Irish is in italics; it has a different font. You don't see that in other bilingual countries in Europe. Um, if Irish is really a co-came um, equal with English, or in fact, actually, it's the first official language, why do we have road signage where you know Irish? names for places are not um are, are not as visible as the english ones and um the other thing on grassroots um uh, activity uh, the role of grassroots movements like the pop quail talk i think that's very very important we've also had that in brussels as well um so um anyway i think yeah the eu status is, is a great development and um hopefully there will continue to be more improvements yeah, there's a couple of things I, I'm going to get you to elaborate on a little bit. But first, Theresa, could you talk to us about the, the EU-funded European Language Equality Project that you're a part of? Yeah, no problem. So the in 2018, um, essentially, there was a resolution passed um, called, uh, it was based on a report called, um, I think it was European Languages in the Digital Age or something like that. I don't have that, sorry. <laughs> The exact wording of it here but the the idea behind it was to um safeguard european languages um in this uh digital age and so i touched on it earlier but essentially we have this risk facing uh, a lot of european language and i mean a lot it's not just irish and maltese there, um, there's you know languages such as finnish because of the low number of speakers um they're facing uh, the risk of digital extinction. And so what that means is if technology is not there to support the language as we move in further into this digital age um, into our AI world, if the language isn't supported, so that means the technology doesn't recognize, understand, can't process the language, people shift to using another language that is supported. So the idea behind the uh, European Language Equality Project, the ELE project, now the focus of that one is, um, because it's based on this resolution, it's looking at trying to make languages uh, digitally equal. So digital equality across the languages in Europe by 2030. And so why I say again, I, I'm all on board for <laughs> ambitious projects. It's very ambitious, but if we get in the on the right direction, this is a good thing. And so for the moment, uh, DCU is actually coordinating this uh, ELE project. It's an 18 month project where that sets out an agenda and a um, strategic, strategic roadmap in order to define how we're going to reach this digital equality by 2030. Um, so DCU coordinating, there's 52 partners, we have um, technology companies, we have um, universities, government bodies and so on across, uh, across Europe. And it's covering all 24 official EU languages plus 60 plus minority, regional and lesser used languages. So it's really a, a huge project. At the moment, we're at the stage of identifying how well or how badly each language is supported. And we do that by looking to see, do we have spell checkers? Do we have autocorrect? Simple as that, you know, an autocorrect when you know when you were texting in Irish and it keeps changing it to an English word, that type of thing. Or if I wanted to put comments on the journal website, does it support Irish or is it going to change it for me? It's going to be difficult. And what's the chances of people then shifting to choose in English? Um, do we have serious? Do we have Alexa? No, we don't. Not for Irish. We don't. So this is the type of thing we're reporting on all the languages. We then get an overall picture of how languages compare to each other and how they rate against English, especially because that's where all the, the technology advances are taking place. And then based on that, through what the, the information we've gathered is trying to then identify what can we do? What can the European Commission actually do in terms of funding, setting up a um, strategic program for research and development to try to close these gaps. Um, just uh, to bring you in, uh, Jim, on that, what is the EU doing and how well is it or how good is it at protecting linguistic diversity? What safeguards are there for minority language from an EU perspective? Well, look, at in terms of minority languages, I, I 
could speak more on the, on the 24 official languages uh, in terms of that. Uh, obviously, you can communicate with your uh, representatives in any of those languages. You can, you're supposed to be able to get your legisl all legislation in all of those languages. I have friends who are lawyer linguists in the European Council, in the Council of the European Union, and they have been very, very, very busy and had a lot of very late nights in the past uh, six weeks or even more when it comes when getting out Irish language um, versions of the, the latest sanctions uh, against Russia, for example. Uh, when it comes to the minority languages, um, I know, yeah, of course, there is, there's a European charter for minority and regional languages. Um, that's actually something from the, I think, the Council of Europe, so not the European Union. But I do know that in the European Parliament, um, we, while there is a focus on the 24 uh, official languages, if you go into the Parliament's chamber in, in Brussels or Strasbourg, you see the interpreting booths for those 24 languages. Uh, we do also provide services in other languages, including Luxembourgish and Catalan, for example. And um, there is also a lot of funding when it comes to um, protecting uh, these minority languages. And um, some of them are, you know, very strong and vibrant languages like uh, like Catalan, for example, and some of them are in a weaker in a weaker state. Um, I I mean, as you as you mentioned at the beginning, I actually work now on relations with Southeast Asia and with ASEAN, ASEAN, which is the basically the Southeast Asian equivalent of the European Union, though it's not as integrated yet. But uh, they have a different approach when it comes to languages. They only have one. Um, working language, which is English. Um, so if they ever wanted to um, reach the level of integration that we have achieved in the European Union, I think they'd need to revisit that because um, obviously most of the people in Southeast Asia, while there are some countries that are have a lot of English speakers, um, there are a lot more languages in Southeast Asia. And if they want to um, have an integrated uh, union um, uh, along the lines of what we have in the European Union, I think they would need uh, to have uh, more uh, official working languages. Tracy, you want to come in there? Yeah, I might just add to that in the sense that, um, so as um, Jim pointed out, I mean, there's the official languages, and we can look at it that way, and the regional minority languages. Um, I do know that there's more of a focus recently on preserving this cultural and linguistic diversity in Europe. And there is actually a recent call for a Horizon um, research program, right? Horizon funding. So this is a European funding program. And it actually is called Safeguarding Endangered Languages in Europe. So this, like, that's promising. They're all going in the right direction. Um, but for the last, since 2015, we've actually been involved with a um, project called the European Language Resource Coordination. And the idea behind this is um, Europe wants to have this digital single market, okay? So where everything is goods and people flow freely and they don't want language barriers to prevent any of this. And so one way of improving this is to facilitate communication through machine translation. And the European Commission, which Jim would know, has a translation system called the e-translation system, and it's available to everyone in public administration across Europe. So we've been trying to collect Irish translated data from Ireland in public administration to hand over to European Commission to make that translation system available. So um, multilingualism and diversity is actually at the core of Europe and at the heart of Europe. So this is what I have learned, at least in the last several years, and it's promising. I just hope that it trickles down to this national level a bit quicker than it has maybe until now. That's fair. Um, what are good examples that we can learn from in terms of promoting languages? And, you know, are things like Ireland's Gael School and other efforts to promote the language, does that serve a model for things that can be used elsewhere in Europe? Or, or is there something in Europe that is happening that we can learn from here? I can, I can add, I don't want to take over, Jim. <laughs> um, Not at all. I think right, Gail Scullin are fantastic. Um, I just think it's shifting attitudes from a ver and beliefs from a very young age that it just becomes normal. I think our main issue in Ireland is that we are English speaking, English speaking countries. I've lived in the US, I've lived in Australia. We suffer from this monolingualism. And we're actually fearful of being in a bilingual society or a multilingual society. Um, when that becomes normalized, I think that'll be better. So, for example, I'm visiting Valencia at the moment. Uh, before I came here, I didn't know that this is a local language, Valenciano, which is actually a type of Catalan, so dialect of Catalan. 
Um, I don't, I, I'd be careful about what I'll say because I could probably upset somebody and maybe it's another language, but um, here people just speak Valenciano, that's it. And they'll switch to Castellana if that's Spanish, if you need to, but there's no big deal. And so the kids go to, most kids go to Valenciano schools, but they learn both languages and just carry on life with no big deal, right? So I think the issue is uh, Irish people's uh, aversion to living in a, a bilingual society. They're just not used to it or maybe don't know how it can operate. Whereas the rest of Europe, which Jim could attest to living in Brussels, quite happily live in multilingual environments. Um, and there should be, there's no big deal and there shouldn't be a big deal about it really. So I think Gale School and are fantastic. And again, social media, I think is really, really uh, another a strong way to leverage um, improved use. Jim, you mentioned, we mentioned at the start that you taught at a university in Minneapolis, taught Irish at it. Uh, and, you know, there's been a, reports of spikes in people living abroad, studying Irish, which kind of, you know, goes to maybe what Therese was saying about there being a healthier perception of bilingualism abroad. You know, what do you think about how the Irish language is viewed abroad, um, either in, in Europe or elsewhere? Look, I think that, uh, I mean, first of all, I, I would just say that the most important thing really for me is education. And it kind of, uh, I, I can't understand why, and the many Irish people can't understand why, after 14 years of uh, education in Irish in the school system, people don't come out uh, fluent. And I mean, I'm there's a school outside the door here, uh, which is a, a Flemish-speaking uh, school in Brussels. You have French-speaking schools, um, but regardless, most people... Um, are in school, they come out and they have a decent level of uh, proficiency in both uh, Dutch and in French that's here in Belgium. Uh, there are other you know, by cases like uh, the, the Swedish speaking uh, minority in Finland and so on and, um, uh, and Luxembourg. Um, and I think it all boils down to education. Um, the, in terms of uh, the interest in Irish in America, um, it was, I, I taught Irish for a year in a university in Minneapolis. Um, I was surprised when I arrived in America to hear that there are actually more universities in North America that teach Irish than teach um, what you would think are much stronger languages, such as uh, the Scandinavian languages like Swedish or, or Greek and so on. Um, there was a huge, there's a huge interest. Uh, there are some, there are universities um, across Amer America where you can learn Irish. And in my classes that I was teaching, actually, most of the students were not from an Irish American background. Uh, we had people from very, very different uh, backgrounds, uh, Jewish Americans, Latino people. And they were simply interested in, in learning the language because of their interest in Irish culture and so on. And they see it linked and intertwined with that. Um, and also, um, I mean, another aspect is, you know, Duolingo. I think Irish is one of the uh, strongest languages with the most number of learners on Duolingo as well. So that's that's something that's really to be encouraged. Yeah, no, I, I, it's, it's really kind of interesting getting it from a, someone abroad or, you know, some, I have a friend from the Balkans who's always asking me to teach her Irish. You know, it's interesting that there's just this kind of interesting, uh, just learning a language for the love of it almost. Um, it's something quite alien to a lot of people. So, uh, Theresa, if I could ask you very quickly before we come to the Q and A's, and I remind people if they do have questions to get them in now, because we are going to um, to get to the Q and A shortly. The European uh, Language Equality Project is carrying out that citizen survey, asking people's perspectives on how they believe their language is supported, which mm -hmm. is kind of an interesting idea. What What are you expecting? to get out of that or what are you hoping to learn from that? Okay, so that feeds into this sort of uh, analysis that we're doing to find out just how well or badly languages are supported. The, we have translated this survey into quite a number, over 30 languages, to make sure that we have a broad reach and we get uh, feedback from citizens. So just your average user of technology. We have actually consulted experts in the field and we've consulted certain groups, um, NGOs like Wikimedia or, or whatever, but we're now we want to get the average person's perception. The thing is that most people don't stop to think 
is my language supported by technology? They don't join the dots between uh, AI is broad umbrella. We've got language technology, which basically is us trying to us and I say us uh, researchers or developers trying to teach computers how to understand the human language. And then how does that actually impact on the future of a language? Now, a lot of the technology we have these days and there's such a change, you know, in terms of chatbots um the government polling online to you know crawling through tweets to see what's the poll outcome what do we think the trends are what's the opinions the sentiment analysis opinion mining and so on and um, our lives are going like that in our english speaking world um but we don't stop to think how is that going to affect the other world that we can live in which is the other language world are we going to end up living that disconnected lives or are people going to end up shifting and so what we hope to get is sort of feedback if people that'd be great if people could fill it out today actually it's in english um, and irish but um if you could fill it out and say I feel or not that uh, the language is well supported. These are the technologies I currently use. We have a list of certain things like search tools, machine translation, spell checking, and so on. And what we're trying to gauge is from that, the aggregate results, uh, how the language is actually being used through technology. And also we have the questions of what do you not use but you'd like to use? And I'm sure a lot of people would like to speak to Siri and Alexa and any other voice activated system through Irish and they, and they currently can't. Um, so through that, what we're going to do is then back up the analysis we've already made in terms of um, our uh, findings of what tools are out there, what we know are out there available open source or pr provided by the likes of Google um, uh, or Twitter or so on. But uh, this survey then will back that up from the European citizens perspective of how well they feel their language is supported and hopefully get people thinking. Now, you know, people might not have actually realized and thought, oh, whatever, I'll just I'll use this technology in French because it works in French and I'll use it in English because it works in English, but not actually stop to think about their own language. Yeah, it's, you know, someone, Ronan will know about this as well, someone with fathers in their name and he's always trying to fill in forms, you know. At the very I, basic never think, level. That's yeah, a never very think, basic, yeah. like a need that we we should have met. Yeah, and yeah. it's not like Irish is the only language that has accents oh, on no, their letters. absolutely either. not. No. But um, it, that's, um, that's also interesting. We could go on for another while, mm -hmm. but we're going to get to the Q&A session now. Uh, we have some interesting questions from participants. And we'll start with Irla O'Riada, who says, thanks for hosting, about the title of the talk, what the EU can do that the state can't, or what can the EU do that the state can't? I would love to see support there, but can't envisage a role for the EU. So Jim and Teresa, I don't know what you think of that, about what the EU has as a role, um, or what's the most important thing that they can do. I would just say that, um, in, a way, in a way, what the European Union is doing and I, I will speak on behalf of the European Parliament. Um, what the European Parliament is doing, I think, in a, in a way, it's possibly putting pressure on the Irish authorities to uh, replicate the services that we provide in Irish um, in, in, in Ireland. And uh, I mean, for example, if the European Parliament has uh, a dedicated uh, Twitter account in Irish, why can't other you know, similar public bodies in, in Ireland have a dedicated Twitter account in Irish? Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, obviously the European Union doesn't have a role in terms of telling Ireland what to do when it comes to, um, you know, services in Irish and so on. But I think that seeing what's being done in Brussels uh, does probably um, encourage um, the authorities in Ireland to provide similar services in Irish. Because here in Brussels, it's not... Really, now that the derogation is gone and that there are more and more services being provided in Irish, it's uh, it, Irish is just being treated as all the other languages and it's completely natural and normal that all of these services would be provided in Irish. If we, if we could just touch on that, and obviously visibility is always incredibly important when it comes to languages and if Irish is spoken in the, the European Union as a matter of course, that in itself is very important. But I also think it touches on the important point that Teresa was making when it comes to bilingualism in that I think Irish people historically have been quite attached to the idea that we're almost at an advantage by the fact that we speak English as our first language and that gives us an advantage when it comes to business internationally and foreign direct investment and so forth. The reality is that 
a lot of in the, a lot of European countries have quite a high standard of English as a matter of course anyway. So we, that advantage isn't quite as um, as much as I think people envisage it to be. And I think you can see that in the European Parliament as well. Absolutely, the European Parliament could probably do its job throughout English at all times given the um, understanding of the language there, but they don't because it's important to maintain that visibility in all languages because it shows the equality among the members within the European Union. And that alone is why it's important that Irish has that working status um, as of the start of this year. Um, I might move on to the next question we have from Conor Murray, who asks, are the panellists worried about the loss of Gaeltacht Irish? There's no doubt that Gaeltacht that are a brilliant thing for for giving fluency and confidence to children, but given what Theresa says about conducting their lives through through the language, if we can't live and work in Gaeltacht, uh, will the language itself evolve in a way that we lose a lot of the words and dialects and it becomes more generic? I don't know what you think about it, Theresa. Yeah. Um, I can't speak much for the Gaeltachty because I'm not from the Gaeltachty and I think it's very uh, risky for anyone who's not from the Gaeltachty to have an opinion on what should or shouldn't be. Um, I would say there have been studies not too long ago, 2015, to show that the younger generation are because of the presence of technology and the English element of technology, the younger generation are shifting to using English more. And obviously, you know, they've contact with the outside world through English. And it's just it's not a conscious shift it's a shift. Um, I think one issue which has sort of touched on today already from a few angles is a lack of opportunity. And so and I'm not just talking about jobs as a translator um, or an interpreter. There are so many jobs out there that could be Irish language speaking jobs. Um, and I think the focus shouldn't be these jobs, hopefully now since COVID and pandemic, you know, that it can be remote based jobs. But this idea of this shift towards, you know, urban centres and losing Irish speakers, that Irish speakers will feel they can stay in the Gaeltacht areas, that young people can feel that they can stay in the Gaeltacht areas and still have a career that they were hoping for, um, you know, during school. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, just I want to mention this comment from an attendee who says it's interesting that young people are more enthusiastic about the language. For many older people, it was an unhappy experience, hence the, diff, uh, the kind of lack of confidence about speaking. Would love to see more uh, available for older people because I know uh, many I know would love to go back and access it again. I think a lot of Irish people would get that a lot when they know that they're a they're a, um, a language speaker. Um, and then Aina says, Cora in Simul and will know on Meg Oshna Changa Pa Ferber her August in Usodic Astrucon and Aintis or her fall and Fobula Gwitchina. He's asking that are the translation service, excellent translation services in the European Union, the European Parliament institutions, like can you use them or can they be developed and kind of used in the member states, I wonder? Does the person mean uh, the tools for translation or the actual uh, you know, stuff that is there, um, there is, for example, IATE. So I don't work, I, I did an internship, a uh, translation internship in the Council of the EU back 10 years ago. I haven't uh, worked as a translator since then, but mm. there is a tool called IATE, for example, uh, which uh, is uh, I, managed by the European Union, uh, where you can find, uh, you know, term, terminology, uh, that that for sure. Um, other than that, I'm not I'm not really I think entirely could probably sure. Come in just yeah. briefly. Thanks, Teresa. So the, the e-translation system that I talked about that's available to all in, in the public sector and small to medium enterprises. Um, now the availability in general to the wider public of these free services. Um, it is possible. I mean, the possibility is there. The potential is there. It's about investment. There's, there's no funding and investment for this. So, for example, uh, last year we finished up on a project called the Principal Project, where we worked with Rano Ganastrocom, we worked with uh, NUIG, and we worked with uh, Forest Nigelga. And during that project, we got their translation data, built it machine translation systems, and they were able to use them for the period of the project. But without continued funding and without continued planning and strategic um 
uh, development around this area of a framework for technology, it's it, it, there's nothing available for the average public um, yet. So it all comes down to hopefully this digital plan for Irish <laughs> having an impact on the focus that should be currently on improving technology. And I agree with you, Aina, to make it available to everybody. A good point. Um, we're going to wrap it up there. I was going to ask you a, cro- a question at the end, but we don't have time. But I will tell the audience the results of the poll. Um, is the state doing enough to grow the Irish language? 59% said no, and people could do more. That's the majority. 46% said no. Uh, 7% said yes, but people could do more too. And, and uh, 2% said yes, the state is doing enough. So that's quite an emphatic uh, result. Thank you to our panellists, Jim Maher, Dr. Theresa Lynn, and our reporter, Ronan Duffy, for being here. Thanks to our audience for spending the lunchtime with us. We really appreciate your time and your questions and your feedback. And I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Uh, Gurmila Mahagi, we'd love to hear from you if you have any other ideas about the Irish language or what you'd like this topic of the Good Information Project to cover, particularly around the Irish language, Gaeltacht areas and other minority languages. Um, if you'd like to get in touch, you can email goodinformation at thejournal.ie. You can go onto the journal and sign up for our newsletter either which will give you kind of a wrap up of everything that is being written about and discussed. And there, if that's in the chat function there, if you want a, a handy way to it. And you can also join a Facebook group uh, for the Good Information Project, which I think a link will go into the chat on that as well, if you're interested. So, Gurumila Mahagi, Asabeth, Lynn, and you, Bonagi Tanabas and Dara Shaktina, I'll just say, I'm a kind of